Thank you so much. Now, Mike admonished me to talk loudly, much more loudly than he thought I should. Now, can you hear me? Is that a yes? All right, so this is the volume that apparently I should have. Well, it is indeed a treat to be here. Uh, I'm talking about the political economy of ecology, entrepreneurial perspectives. Now, this may be one of the few cheerful and optimistic talks on ecology and environmental quality that you will hear. Um, I'd like you to pay attention to the slide, and I will tell you, you're, you're, even though that slide or a version of that slide has been on several magazine covers, I doubt very much if you recognize it. But that's a slide taken on our ranch. Uh, our ranch is between Bozeman, Montana. How many of you have heard of Bozeman, Montana? Just out of curiosity. A few of you have. Uh, it's between Bozeman, Montana and Yellowstone Park. How many of you heard of Big Sky, Montana? A few more. It's a great place to ski. I'd like you to pay attention to the slides the, the slides uh, that are pictures, not the ones that are, have words, because our foundation occasionally has interns, paid internships for the summer. And if you've ever had a, uh, a thought of hanging around Yellowstone for a summer and uh, working for a think tank, you may have a possibility here. So look at, look at, the, look at the slides, if you will. Bozeman, Montana is the home of Montana State University. And that's where my wife, Ramona, Ramona, would you just signify, that's my wife, Professor Ramona Maritzbaden. That's where she taught, she's pro Professor Emeritus now. She retired very young. Uh, and she, uh, she and I live on this ranch. Uh, my daughter, by the way, who's sitting to the side of my wife, uh, was born there, not on the ranch, but in the hospital in Bozeman, just, just a few miles away. Earlier this summer, uh, I was asked to be a contributor to a new blog. The blog was entitled, This is Bozeman, the name of the town. And they put a heading for me. And the heading was, Voices from, A Voice from the Dismal Science. I said, why did you pick that? I'm not an ecologist. I'm an economic and anthropologist. And they said, well, but economics is a dismal science. And I said, well, no, it isn't. It's been characterized that way, but that's sort of a historical mistake. But economists tend to be optimists, and I will probably pick up that theme later. Well, I'll pick it up later if this thing will continue to move, which it surely will. So if I turned it on to on, would that help? Yeah. Now it will do it. You turned it off. We'll try it again. <laughs> okay. All right. There are two basic divisions of economic I'm sorry, of environmental policy. One involves stuff that kills or injured, injures people and other living things, and that's called sludge. The other division involves the things you see on calendars. Parks, wild lands, wild animals, and water, and so forth. That's the sector or the division of environmental policy that I focus on, and that's called romance. So all environmental science studies can be divided into sludge, which I try to avoid, and romance, which I love to wallow in. That's why we live where we do, on a ranch out between Bozeman and Yellowstone Park. My focus is largely upon the work of entrepreneurs as they work in the romance arena of environmentalism. 
And you can read the slide, I'm absolutely sure of that, but the thing I want to emphasize is the innovative aspect of entrepreneurs. They discover innovative ways to organize and mobilize people and resources to produce things that people value. Habitat, health, and social welfare in particular. Now, that is a picture of Montana State University with the Bridger Mountains in the background. There was a portion of a, a, a new development in political economy that developed there in an institute that my colleagues and I ran. And we began this in the 1970s and we've continued to develop it. And it's just a great place to be, the Bozeman area. And you can see that's rather spectacular. Okay, entrepreneurship. What are the playgrounds of entrepreneurship? First are the commercial entrepreneurs that get the overwhelming amount of attention, and especially in business schools, of course, in business schools. They are interested in entrepreneurs who create things that trade on the markets. Now, I take advantage of those, you take advantage of those, but I'm not terribly interested in that aspect of entrepreneurship. Rather, and the focus today is going to be on social and environmental entrepreneurs. And what social and environmental entrepreneurs really do is they create basically avenues down which people can march their good intentions to, to generate good products. And the products are not products for sale, but the products may be some aspect of environmental management or some social service. And we'll see a few of those as we go around. So there are social and environmental engineers. Examples include, how many of you have heard of Ducks Unlimited? DU, how many, about 10% of you. Um, DU was, construct, was invented, was created in 1937 by people who wanted to save waterfowl habitat. They were mainly people, mainly guys, who wanted to shoot ducks and geese. But there were numerous programs to destroy the breeding grounds of ducks and geese. There are these things called prairie potholes, which are little ponds in the north central part of America and in, and in Canada. And there were numerous government programs that subsidized the filling in and destruction of these ponds and converting them into farmland. And Ducks Unlimited said, gee, if you keep doing that, we won't have any more ducks to shoot. And duck hunting is, is, is an odd, it's up to me, sort of an odd way to spend one's life, but that's okay, or portions of one's life. But in the process of preserving duck habitat, they preserve lots and lots and lots of other habitat for other, for other animals. And one of the important things that they do is they counter the force of government, <coughs> governmental programs that destroy the breeding grounds for ducks and geese. So there are now 600,000 members of uh, Ducks Unlimited they have, I'm absolutely, I guarantee you that they have fundraisers in the triangle. And uh, you are not likely to go to one, uh, but I'm sure you would be welcome if you would. So it's all private. They have all manner of cooperative agreements with farmers and with ranchers, and they also work with uh, state and federal agencies on conservation efforts. Once you have this created, this organization to protect ducks, it's fairly easy to extend it to other things you might want to protect. protect. And you protect the habitat, not the animals themselves. And so near us in Bozeman is another organization called the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, set up on sort of the same lines, same sort of funding mechanisms, all private. Uh, then there's Pheasants Forever, Wild Turkey Federation, and it goes on and on. I don't know how many of these organizations there are, but at least a dozen uh, nationwide, all created by entrepreneurial efforts, and the entrepreneurs provided ways, avenues, 
down which people can march their good intentions. Um, some, Eagle Mount and Warriors in Quiet Waters, they provide outdoor activities for people with serious limit physical or mental limitations. Uh, Eagle Mount, another Bozeman organization, provides a range of 20 plus outdoor activities like fly fishing on a ranch is one, they have an equestrian pro program, they have a kayaking program, and it goes on, skiing, imagine, you don't have any legs and an organization says, we will take you skiing, and you don't have legs. Well, they have developed all manner of sled-like things with skis on the bottom that people can use to ski. It's just amazing what people can in fact create and do, cre do create. That's uh, Ducks Unlimited, that's one of their promo shots. That is Eagle Mount, and this is a program for children with cancer, where they bring them out, in this case, this happened to be at our ranch, when we host them every year. For these kids with cancer, 40% of them will be dead the following year, by the way. They bring them out with their families, with their brothers and sisters for this three, two weeks, I believe it is, of camping in the Rocky Mountains, fly fishing, horseback riding, all manner of activities. Entirely private, no government money at all. It's a, it's a marvelous organization. It happened to be created, by the way, by, the way, by a former uh, person at Montana State University in child development and her husband, uh, who is an uh, Air Force general who brought the F-16 online. That was a, so these are, these are highly competent people. Uh, there's another organization, Cancer Support Community, and that is also on our ranch. And they bring people who have cancer, recovering from cancer, outdoors to experience really wonderful activities. In this case, fly fishing. Again, at no charge. Okay, now, You've all heard the word ecology many, many times. It has two really quite different meanings. One, of course, is a scientific study of organisms and their environment. That's what ecology courses are at universities. But then there's also ecology as a social movement. And that dates, basically the launch of that was uh, on Earth Day in 1970, the ecology movement began. And it was April 22nd of uh, 1970. And by accident or intent, and I have no idea, although I was involved in it, I have no idea, I didn't select the date, uh, it happens to be Lenin's birthday. And uh, that's a, a certain amount of baggage that uh, it's still taints in some way uh, the organization. But the green ecology movement has a mantra, which is not to suggest that everyone who considers herself or himself green uh, believes this, but it's fairly, these are fairly standard. Um, we should have zero, it's their mantra, not my admonition, we should have zero economic growth. We should have zero population growth. And most other people want the wrong things. They're Americans in particular, they're too materialistic and they should you know, dial back. But it's other people who want the wrong things. Um, and this green or progressive orientation toward environmental management basically re believes strongly that we should transfer more and more control over natural resources to the government, federal government preferably. Now it's, it's important, of, now 
I want to make something, I want to make sure that you understand, that I understand, that we do, in fact, need government to protect the environment. There's no question about that. We have to have government to protect from externalities and to manage common pool resources. However, however, when you go much beyond that, you run into problems, which we'll, I will talk about for a little bit. By the way, one of the other aspects of, uh, or features of the green movement, ecology movement is, we are running out of stuff. We're running out of everything. That's been a tradition since at least 1971 and probably before, but we're gonna run out of all material resources. I'm gonna tell you something. I'm gonna give you a true, empirical, universal generalization. It's really important. If you hear people saying, oh, we're gonna run out of titanium or whatever it is, or oil. When property rights are clear and well-defined and transferable, we never have run out of any material substance. And I doubt if we ever will. It has never happened. Scarcity has yet to win a race against creativity when property rights are secure and the market process operates. Now that may sound like a radical statement, but maybe you guys are sufficiently sophisticated and maybe the culture has changed enough that, that you already know that. It'd be nice if you did, but we for goodness sakes do not need government to keep us from running out of everything. But what happens when we do have the government step in for environmental management? Well, among other things, things go black. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, okay, here we go. What is that a picture of? Anyone want to tell me? What is that? It's, it's sort of a cartoon picture. It's, if, if you see it on your screen, what I have on my little screen down here, we see a, a, a big ear of corn with a gas delivery pump on it. Is that, is that correct? What does that symbolize? I heard, it, I heard it two right answers. Sir? Ethanol. ethanol. What is ethanol other than something that, that ruins many engines? It's a fuel. It's a fuel made from corn. And the laws, the regulations are such that 40% of America's corn crop is devoted to generating ethanol. Now, I have nothing particularly against ethanol, but for goodness sakes, we should drink it, not burn it. Um, it has significant environmental harms, of course, but what it is, it's a political corruption mechanism. Why is it the case that the Iowa primaries are so important to politicians? Because politicians can go there and basically promise people in Iowa that we are continue, we're gonna continue to subsidize this product by mandating that 40% of the corn go in to producing ethanol, which at the very best is environmentally neutral and probably is environmentally moderately or, or maybe even substantially detrimental. But once you set the mechanism up and you get the big manufacturing ethanol plants and you have farmers dependent upon having this market for their corn, it's really, really hard to turn that stuff off. And so we continue it. And you look around, oh, and by the way, the justification 
of course, for having ethanol and the ethanol mandates is not, oh, we're going to make already rich people even richer, but rather to wean us from dependence on foreign oil and to protect the environment because it's supposedly, supposedly it's better for the environment, which of course is nonsense. It's simply not true. And among other things, it has distorted the market for corn such that more fertilizer is dumped into corn. It's more corn in production than, than the market would put in, into production. And the farmers produce more runoff, more externalities, because they put more fertilizer in, which goes into the watershed, which goes down, ultimately, down the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico, where we have this growing dead zone. Wow. Is this a good thing? Of course not. It's not a good thing at all. Um, there are dozens, hundreds, thousands of examples of this sort of mischief and worse that is politically corrupting and environmentally costly, as well as being economically grossly inefficient. You, the, the sugar quota is one, concentrates benefits on a very small number of, of sugar cane and beet producers, creates an immense amount of, of environmental damage. Uh, then there's uh, the, the wool incentive program, which we won't talk about very much. We won't talk about it all. I just want to mention it. But there are dozens of examples of distortions of rent. Have you talked about, have you talked about rent seeking in here yet? You have. Okay. Environmental, the environmental arena is a great arena for rent seeking. It, it really, really works well. And I don't mean that as a compliment, of course. Okay, we, I talked about two kinds of, two divisions of environmental studies. One, romance, what I specialize in. And the other, sludge. Uh, here, here we see mine waste. Uh, it turns out, by the way, that the Environmental Protection Agency act, indirectly caused this through just bad management. It's just stuff that poured out of a mine. Uh, here's the romance side. The, the picture, the white picture with that line of uh, whatever that line is, well, that's a line of elk. There are roughly 160 elk in that, uh, in that picture. They're going onto our ranch. Um, there's a, we live just on the edge of the, a few miles from the forest, and the elk hang out there, and they winter there. How many of you have seen or heard of the movie A River Runs Through It? Okay, that was a, a movie that captivated people's, in, or, sorry, that, that captivated people's attention, and it's a movie about fly fishing, and it caused a huge boom in fly fishing. And it turns out that a river runs through it was filmed, much of it was filmed just a very few miles from us. There's elk again. Uh, just another, that's, uh, actually that's some irrigated alfalfa land with the mountains in the background. This is, again, examples of the romance area of environmentalism and, and why I love it. Okay, what are some entrepreneurial alternatives to command and control via government. Now, there can be entrepreneurs operating in government, and this is just a great story. I think it's a great story. I'm sure you all know about beavers. Beaver, the, 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 I think it's our largest rodent, but I'm not sure. But beavers are these fur-bearing animals that, among other things, build dams. And beaver do a lot of mischief if they're in an area with farmers, ranchers, and orchards, orchardists. But they do an immense amount of good in the backcountry. They regulate water flow. I'm sorry, I'm sure that you all know that beavers, which weigh up to about 50 pounds, they cut down trees, they eat the intercambium, they build dams and they build lodges from, from, uh, from the trees. 
And when they build the dams, they make ponds. And the ponds are gathering places for lots and lots of animals. And they also capture the water and the water is gradually released and they build fisheries by building the ponds. Well, it turns out that there are a lot of areas where the beaver have been exterminated for one reason or another. Often they were over-trapped and so forth, but areas in the back country where there had been beaver, the beaver were important components to the wildlife ecology, but the beaver were extinct, <laughs> locally extinct. So the Fish and Wildlife Department of the state of Idaho said, we need to reintroduce the beaver to these areas where they're now extinct. But there's a problem with doing that. This is in 19, in the, right after World War II. The problem is how do you transport beaver? Well, beavers weigh, let's assume, an average of 40 pounds. But you have to carry them in something. They won't ride horseback on their own. So they put them in boxes and strap them on the side of pack horses, and guess what? The beaver were rowdy, and they scared the pack horses. And also, the beaver don't like it to be hot. And so they would die as they're going up the mountains in these pack horses. It was expensive, it was difficult, it was dangerous. And so what happened was, they said, we need to find another way to get the beaver to the back country. And so some guys in the Idaho uh, Fish and Game Department said, well, I know how we can do that. We, some of us, were in the paratroopers in World War II, which was only five years ago, in their time. And we landed all manner of things with parachutes. Soldiers behind the lines, we sent in medical supplies, we sent in weapons. We can also, why don't we drop beaver? So they came up with these, I thought, very clever means of building these boxes. They put a beaver in and they practiced with a be male beaver they named Geronimo and they took him up in an airplane, dumped him out with a parachute in the box. Box would hit, spring open eventually, and Ger Geronimo would be released and recapture him and kept dialing in their experiment. There's a photo of actually dropping beaver into backcountry. And this was highly successful, a bizarre but highly successful, successful venture. Here's something far more recent. Whooping cranes, by the way, there are people, God knows why this is the case, but I promise you it's true. There are people who, do, who have bizarre tastes and preferences and visions. And there are people who really, really, really think it's important that we have cranes flying cranes. There are 12 species of cranes in the world. Two of them are in the United States. And the whooping crane almost became extinct. It was down to just a handful of individuals in the 1940s. In 1967, it was, it was described, as, it was classified as endangered. That was before the Endangered Species Act, but there were still agencies that, that, that could identify, excuse me, a species as endangered. Wow, what was the problem here? Well, the pr problem had to do with, they had been, actually the cranes had been hunted early in the 1900s. Uh, the feathers were important for, for millinery purposes, not military, millinery purposes. The feathers were used in ladies' hats and so forth. A habitat was lost, and, and it, it was very clear that we might lose that entire species. So an organization had spun up by the name of the International Crane Foundation. It's run by a guy that Ramona and I know a little bit. And he, working with the University of Wisconsin, 
came up with a program to preserve the whooping cranes. And they, <laughs> Archibald, George Archibald's his name, he made contact with the Kohlers, K-O-H-L-E-R, people who Ramona and I know, people uh, from Wisconsin, and the Kohlers uh, were, uh, owned some companies that you've, that you've heard of, I'm sure, and they had a private jet, big, uh, big enough to haul 12 people. And so George Archibald talked to the Kohlers and said, hey, look, let's go up to Canada and steal some whooping crane eggs from the nests and bring them back. We'll hatch them in Wisconsin so we'll raise chicks. Raising birds isn't all that difficult. So they went up there with ornithologists. The colors flew them up there in their, in their jet. They hung around for a few weeks. They gathered the eggs and sur surreptitiously and then the cranes would lay more eggs, of course, because they'd want to have at least two eggs in their nest. And they put the eggs in incubators, and then they flew them back to Wisconsin and they hatched them out. Well, well and good. But that, that was only the first part of the problem. The next part of the problem is, how do we get them to a new wintering ground somewhere on the Gulf Coast, Texas or, or Louisiana, preferably? Now, listen to me carefully on this, because it's so bizarre that it, it, it's, almost, it's, it's hard to believe, but this, here's what they did. You've heard of birds imprinting, okay? So they have these eggs, and they're in incubators in Wisconsin. And when they hatch, the people who take care of them are dressed as though for Halloween, except they are wearing crane costumes. They are dressed to look like cranes. So they're in white, and they have some mask on their face with a beak, and they have stuff on their arms like wings, and they're the right color. And so the cranes, come out of the eggs, they've never seen anything, but hey, they're programmed genetically by evolution to see these creatures. Oh, these are obviously our parents. So they'll show that, well, the parents showed them how to eat, how to walk around, and, a vet, and the cranes grew up. They've never seen a person. They've only seen cranes. They were carefully isolated from people. So the cranes start, you know, we have geese on our place, and, they, and, and uh, we also have sandhill cranes that Ramon is very proud of on our place that are not in danger. And so the, the cranes are watching these, you know, their, their parents, you know, bop about, making sure they got food and all. But now the cranes, they're, they're ready to start flying. And so what do the parents do? Parents can't fly very well. But what they did, you know what ultralight airplanes are? They got a bunch of ultralight airplanes. And the parents would get in an ultralight airplane that were also dolled up as much as they could to look like cranes. And they would take these little hops. And when the birds learn to fly, first they fly 10 yards then 50 yards, then 100 yards, and pretty soon they can circle around. They circle around flying, following these ultralight aircrafts. Isn't this just amazing that this happened? That there are people who care enough about this bizarre bird that's almost extinct, that they invest a huge amount of time and money to keep them alive, to keep the, the, the whole population alive, to, to, to reestablish a viable breeding population of whooping cranes. There's a book, here it is, 
chasing the ghost birds, saving swans and cranes from extinction. And there's a picture of an ultralight from the book and the cranes following the ultralight. Well, an ultralight doesn't fly very far, but then cranes don't fly very far each day either. So they had a series of hops that they had carefully programmed, scheduled out, and so the birds would follow the ultralights and then they had slightly, then they had larger planes as well. They would follow them all the way till they got them down to Louisiana to new nesting wintering grounds that they'd established and leased and maybe they'd bought it, I don't remember that. Uh, what an amazing adventure in environmental entrepreneurship. Okay. Um, questions about beaver or cranes? Two, six, yes, ma'am. No, oh, a great question, thank you. No, they didn't make any money. They spent hundreds of thousands, oh, the beaver. It's a state agency, it's a, it's a state bureaucracy. They don't need to make money, they're, they're, no. They didn't make money, but they were successful in using, in, in, in mobilizing resources and putting them together to do this bizarre thing of dropping beaver by parachute. But it's a small part of the state budget. I don't know what it cost. My guess is it was a few thousand bucks. Uh, this is 1950. There are lots of old military trainers laying around. States could get them by just asking for them. The parachutes, lots of parachutes were laying around. I don't know how they did it, but the important thing that was creative, no, they didn't make any money for sure, but they did a lot of good when they reestablished the beaver. I mean, good, a lot of good for the ecosystem. And in terms of the cranes, that was an expensive venture. What does it cost per hour to run a private jet that will hold 12 people? I don't know what the number is, but it's, it's not a trivial number. Uh, it costs ballpark a million bucks a year to keep a private jet, uh, just the maintenance and so forth. But these are people who really care about conservation. They've done lots and lots of other things as well. They're wonderful people. I'm, I'm biased, obviously. They're very good people who supported, uh, full disclosure, they've supported some of my work and not just because we have cranes. If, okay, now let me move. Political economy entrepreneurship, creating new social and economic arrangements is an entrepreneurial exercise. How many of you have been to Yellowstone Park? How many of you have heard of Yellowstone Park? How many of you would like to go to Yellowstone Park? Okay, those of you who just raised your hand on that last one, think about the possibility of doing an internship at the foundation just outside of Yellowstone Park. That's us. Okay, Yellowstone Park was created in 1872. It was the world's first national park. Mike, how am I doing on time? We're okay? Okay, that was a marvelous creation. Now it was, some have said, it's America's best idea. It's, it's not, in my view, uh, but it's one of the best for sure. And it, what a novel thing. Here's this chunk of ground, 2.2 million acres, which is you know, moderately decent size, that had these bizarre geological features and a huge amount of unusual wildlife. And so the government said, look, we need to protect this because it's just of national interest. And who are the, by, can you guess who the big allies were of the move to protect Yellowstone Park? Anyone want to hazard a guess? The avaricious railroad companies. Why? There used to be something called passenger trains. And railroads said, oh, this could be a new market. We'll get these national parks scattered about and we'll build hotels and lodges there and wealthy people from the east will then take our trains to get out and tour the parks. So, and I don't, that wasn't the primary driver, but it was an important driver of the park. So, 
Yellowstone was created in 1872. And, but once you create it, they've never done this before. It's a new organization. It's a new institution, the first in the world. Well, you've got to protect it. Why do you have to protect it? Well, because it has these interesting geological features that people might, well, will, in fact, and did uh, scavenge. They would you know, come in with axes and hammers and stuff and knock pieces of, of geological, uh, petrified uh, trees and stuff like that. They'd knock them off and they'd poach animals and so forth. So we've got to protect this thing. So how do you think they did it? What, what's the best way to do that, given the, the institutions they had? Any, any, any guesses of, of who, who ran Yellowstone Park in the early years? Any guesses? Well, then I'll give you the answer. I, I, there's no reason why I would expect you to know this, by the way. But the answer is, of course, the US Army. So the Army wasn't doing anything. The Civil War was long over. They were going around, how can I say it gently? There's no way to say it gently. They were going around killing Indians and uh, killing buffalo and building forts and so forth. But they didn't really have much to do. So they put the Army and the Army Corps of Engineers in charge of Yellowstone Park. And they did a good job of protecting the park's wildlife from poachers. And they also, the Army Corps of Engineers is an engineering outfit. And so they built, they built roads and they built bridges. And they basically, and if you ever go to the, if, oh, how many of you have been to Yellowstone? Okay, do you remember the town of Mammoth, the park headquarters? Anyone remember it? What did it look like, those of you who've seen it? It looked like an army base. Why does it look like an army base? Because it was built as an army base. They have these big stone buildings. They're very nice, it's laid out in nice rows. It's a great place. Well, 1872, and the army's running the park. And there's a guy who was born in 1859, and his name is George, I'm sorry, John Stoddard. And John Stoddard is a graduate of Williams College and then went to Yale Divinity School for two years. And he toured the world, interesting places, Ceylon, India, Egypt. And he came back, to, and this is before radio, TV, of course, television and so forth. And people in those years, some few people, made their money going to interesting places and coming back and tell, talking to, and they'd lecture about it. And people said, wow, this is entertainment. And so John Stoddard did these lectures and here's his, a, a book that I found and had digitized, the copyright had, had expired more than 50 years ago. Yellowstone National Park, 94 pages with pictures by John Stoddard in which he makes the observation, no reasonable person could possibly imagine anyone other than or any organization other than the army running Yellowstone Park. That is an obvious necessity. Wow, isn't that fascinating? Now that was not a direct quote, but that's exactly what he said. And I have the quote in my introduction to this book. Well, then in 1916, Congress created the National Park Service within the US Department of Interior. And so the Park Service ran, then ran the park and ran, oh, come on. I don't know if it matters anymore, but there we go. Yellowstone National Park. It also, ran the other parks and national monuments that were, uh, that evolved, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. It's just a great place, our backyard. 
However, there were serious, serious problems with the management of the park. And the reason for that is, if it's government land, it's really political land. And so the management is dependent upon or constrained by political forces. And so as a result, they made some very serious errors in the Park Service when it took over management in 1918. It was, the Park Service created in 1916, it took over management of the park in uh, 1919, and it was run according to, quote, scientific management. And, and scientific management involved, among other things, managing the roads, managing the wildlife, managing the fires. Forest burn, I mean, that's what happens. So, the Army Corps of Engineers built a road system, built bridges, uh, and the Department of Interior set out people to exterminate the wolves because they divided animals into two categories, good animals and bad animals. Good animals were ones with big brown eyes. Bad animals were ones with little yellow squinty eyes. And the mission was to kill those with yellow squinty eyes. So they killed all the elk. I'm sorry, they killed all the wolves. And as a result, what do elk like to do best more than anything else? Make more elk. They enjoy that a lot. And they go through these rituals in the fall called retting. And as a result, they make lots of elk. And so the population of elk in the park, they've eliminated the predators, the, the wolf. So the population of the elk got up to something, we don't know exactly, three times, four times, five times the carrying capacity. They, they beat the bejesus out of the, out of the land. They changed the vegetation. They drove out the beaver. Uh, it was, that was a wreck. They also said, tourists love bears. So what we're gonna do, and they have hotels in the park, we are going to feed the bears hotel garbage. Because a fair amount of the food served in the hotels was not eaten. So they gathered it up and took it out and dumped it in lo specific locations for the bears to come eat. My wife, when she was a little girl, used to see the grizzlies come to the dump and eat this garbage. So what we had, what they did was develop basically some welfare dependent bears who had lost fe fear of humans. The third thing that they did was to put out all fires essentially immediately. Every fire should be put out within it one day of it being found, discovered. And as a result of that, there weren't fires that cleared the underbrush in, the, in, the, in, in Yellowstone. And so what would happen is just keep accumulating and accumulating and accumulating. And there were places where there were 100 tons of fire, basically of firewood, dead and down trees on the ground per acre. And a football field is an acre. Imagine 100 tons of firewood on a football field. So when a fire came through, which it did in 88, it burned approximately half the park. So these were all mistakes that were made. But there's another, I think, more significant political economy mistake and that is because the establishment of parks and monuments is a political process, local, local communities have and congressmen and women have incentives to create ever more of them. Now, the backlog for maintenance on the parks and the monuments keeps growing and yet, they, the political process generates ever more of these things that we can't take care of now. This is a recipe that does not have a successful ending within the, within the current system. So what's going to happen is new institutions are going to, involve, are going to evolve. Of that, I'm, I'm 
simply confident that will occur. And the question is, what might it be? So I'm going to end with this photo of something called the American Prairie Reserve, which is a new organization, new, relatively new. It was created just over a decade ago, I guess 15 years now, by, actually, by accident perhaps, one of my former students and the general manager, manager uh, is a fellow, Pete Geddes, who worked with me for over 14 years in our foundation. And this is a model of an, of an alternative management scheme. It's an entrepreneurial creation. It's one and a half times the size of Yellowstone. It's up in the northeast corner of Montana. So it's roughly 3.5 3 million acres. That's a lot of ground. And that is another model that may, may evolve to be the dominant model for managing the romance sector the, of, our, of America. I have reached the end of my pictures, I think. Oh, no, I haven't, not quite. Well, maybe I have, accidentally. I probably have. OK. That, these are just some pretty pictures. That is a predator-proof buffalo. It weighs 4,000 pounds plus. It's made out of ex, uh, agriculture and logging junk. And that's in our backyard, it's the backyard of our ranch. By the way, the largest herd of buffalo or bison in America is uh, in our neighbor's ranch, uh, Ted Turner. It's at 5,000 of them. We have one, but ours is predator proof. And there's just on the ranch, is feeding steers with the world's only solar powered, solar moved uh, hay feeder, big bale feeder. And just another uh, ranch picture. And there's Ramona and me on our deck. And uh, with that happy photograph, let me just tell you what a treat it has been to come and talk with you. I would love to talk about any of this at any length, but I think we end in about 30 seconds. Mike, is anything else? Yes, sir. Um, can you give an example? Uh, you said um, slide eight, that when property rights are well advised and it's been affordable, we've never run out of material funds. Can you give an example of that? Sure. Yeah, uh, you're asking, they're, they're, well, let me turn it around. I made an assertion. I made a strong empirical assertion. Uh, I said we never run out of material stuff if there are clear property rights in it and the market process can operate. There, show me an exception to that. We didn't run, you, no, you couldn't possibly know this, but in 1973, on October 11th of 73, there was an oil embargo from Middle East. Oil at that time was selling for $2 a barrel, that Middle Eastern oil. And then it went up to, uh, to 12, and then it went up to 15, then it went up to 32 in a quite short, quite short period of time. And there was widespread fear, we are running out of oil. We are running out of, and, and uh, minerals and so forth. It simply doesn't happen. And re oh, here's why it doesn't happen. And that is, price gives uh, signals and incentives. When stuff has become scarce, the price goes up. And when that happens, people conserve, they substitute, and they innovate. And that always happens. And we have yet, to, now I'm not saying we'll never run out of, out of any material thing. We never have. And the reason is that cr creativity always trumps scarcity. So far. And I, again, I'm talking about material things. It's entirely possible we could run out of very, very valuable things like liberty. That's entirely possible. It's happened in most countries, uh, but that's, that's a different arena. Is that satisfactory? I love to answer questions.
I might, yes. Would you consider yourself an environmentalist? Would I consider myself an environmentalist was the question. Yes. My goodness gracious. We put our ranch, aside from a little 30-acre chunk, we, put our, we paid to put our ranch in a conservation easement. So in, for, in, in, for time and all eternity, now that probably will change, but legally, it can only be used for agriculture and wildlife. It can't be developed. Yeah, I'd say that's, budgets are very good tests of sincerity. So we, we are facing the opportunity cost of not being able to develop the ranch located between Bozeman and Yellowstone Park. We, so we paid, we've, that's a, we w willingly did that. Plus we paid something like a few tens of thousands of dollars to, put, to pay into an endowment to monitor the ranch to make sure it's, we don't abuse it in any way. And, the, and when we die, which you know, would be sometime fairly soon, I believe in actuarial tables, um, then it, it, is, it is saved supposedly in perpetuity. Now, libertarians have some quarrels about perpetuities, but we need not get into that. Yes, definitely. Also, I started a conservation club in the fifth grade in my little country school, and I've been doing it ever since. And I fought the government and lots and lots and lots of programs that were basically economically inefficient and environmentally destructive. So yeah, I am an environmentalist, but I'm also a classical liberal. I mean, liberty, liberty is a really important value to me. Flags of liberty, I, I fly whenever I wear a tie, almost whenever I wear a tie. I have another tie that I recently got, a, a freedom tie. So I alternate between my liberty ties and my freedom tie. Yes, sir. I apologize. I simply didn't hear your question. I'm sorry. Mike, can you help me on Yes, does your definition of entrepreneurship require profit seeking or are there other goals that are consistent with entrepreneurship? Oh my goodness, yes. And um, see, my, the people who created Ducks Unlimited, my first example, they didn't do it for profit in a monetary sense. They did it to create value, but the value was protecting habitat for ducks. And by the way, half of the people who, who support, Half of the 600,000 people who support Ducks Unlimited are not hunters. They just want to provide the habitat. Uh, the, the, uh, the Eagle Mount for, uh, for, that I showed a picture of, the cancer support community, these are not for profit. The, I think by far the most interesting entrepreneurial efforts are the not for profit entrepreneurial efforts. And I've been monitoring them and encouraging them and supporting them for a very long time. I was one of the founders of the Warriors in Quiet Waters, for example. One more question. Yes, sir. Oh, no, you're just rat scratching. OK. Yes. Um, so a lot of the social and environmental entrepreneurs that you talked about was based in North America, where we have the luxury of uh, putting a lot of money and effort into environmental programs. How do you feel about entrepreneurs in developing countries, where they need the money to Okay, so the question was, there's a difference between entrepreneurs in a place wallowing in wealth, like us, and uh, people in third world countries. And if, if I, I'm trying to state it correctly, what you, what you said, um, what should be the emphasis in the second category, in the third world countries? Okay, wealth is a precursor of environmental concern. Another way to say it is poverty is the worst polluter. Until people are at least moderately well off, they do not spend much time or effort worrying about environmental quality. You have to hurt a certain threshold in general, a thir certain threshold before you can shift your attention to goods to the non, to the environmental, to environmental goods. Yes, ma'am. But this is second question. Is that going off of that, how high does that threshold have to be? Do you have to be a nation that's as 
wealthy as the United States, say, or can you be fairly well-to-do in order to reach this environmental pressure? It seems to kick in at, at about a quarter of what our income is. Um, so people earning, who living on $2 a day, definitely not. $5 a day, almost surely not. But you start getting up to $20, $25, $30, $30, $30, then it can kick in. And culture matters a great deal, by the way. A huge, and economists, I think, grossly under, underestimate the importance of culture in general. Not, not, your, not the economists teaching this course, uh, but in general, economists uh, tend to be gear drive people who, who do not uh, understand the importance of culture. Right. Mike, I want to thank you so much for the pleasure of being able to meet with you.